Well, good morning, everyone. Um, uh, welcome uh, to the next in the, the series of uh, low barrier care talks uh, that are part of the entire month of September here at High Rounds. Um, we're really exciting today to have um, two amazing talks um, about amazing programs in Philadelphia and Miami um, as part of low barrier care uh, for people with HIV um, with substance use disorders. Um, so first, I'd like to introduce Dr. Jessica Meisner. Um, she will be uh, going first, uh, followed by Dr. Hansel Tukes, and I'll, I'll introduce Dr. Tukes um, after Dr. Meisner's talk. Uh, but Dr. Meisner um, completed her undergraduate work at the University of Southern California. We won't, we won't hold that against you. <laughs> Earning um, dual bachelor degrees in international relations and, and biological sciences. She subsequently completed a master's of science degree in biohazardous threat agents and emerging infectious diseases at Georgetown University. In 2009, she was selected to serve as uh, the Merzion Science and Technology Fellow at the, Uni the National Academies with the Committee for International Security and Arms Control. Uh, Dr. Meisner graduated from Drexel University College of Medicine in 2013 and she uh, received the Dr. Elias Abrutin Award for Excellence in Infectious Diseases. Um, she went on to complete um, her internal medicine residency at Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center, uh, where she was in the HIV primary care and global health tracks. And during her residency, she also completed a certificate in global health delivery at Harvard School of Public Health. And she went on to complete her infectious diseases fellowship at the University of Pennsylvania, um, during which time she also completed a quality improvement and patient safety fellowship, as well as a master of science in, in health policy. Uh, and during her fellowship, she was awarded the Richard P. Shannon Trainee Award for outstanding leadership in quality and uh, patient safety for the Department of Medicine. Um, she's currently an assistant professor at the University of Pennsylvania in the Division of Infectious Diseases. Um, she recently won the Stephen J. Gluckman Infectious Diseases Faculty Teaching Award, and uh, she is the medical director um, at the Prevention, at Prevention Point Philadelphia, um, the HIV medical director there. Um, and, and Prevention Point is one of the nation's largest syringe service programs in harm reduction organizations. So, Good to see you, Jess. We're looking forward to your talk. Thank you. I need to edit this down. It's a very long introduction. I apologize. Um, can everyone see my slides okay? Um, so thank you so much for having me. I uh, am very excited to share with you kind of the update of what Prevention has been doing. Um, Dr. Bathford was my mentor during my fellowship and my predecessor at Prevention Point. Um, so I'm very excited to be talking to you all. Um, I have no financial disclosures or conflicts of interest. Before I get into our program, I just wanted to give you a little bit of an outline of kind of the area where we're working in. And so Prevention Point is located in Kensington, which is an area of North Philadelphia. And it's historically a very marginalized and impoverished community. Um, specifically, it was very heavily impacted by um, the industrialization of the 60s. And some really disastrous outcomes of the war on drugs in Philadelphia there as well. Um, Philly is a port city. We're actually between two rivers. Um, and Kensington is also right off of major highway, so I-95. And so that really contributes to this long-standing kind of open-air drug economy that's going on in Kensington. And unfortunately, you know, there's a lot of community pressure from, you know, residents, business owners that don't really feel harm reduction works, but also really want to shut us down as an organization at Prevention Plan. Um, so Kensington historically used to have the city's largest encampment referred to as the tracks, which was about a half mile stretch of an abandoned rail line. Um, and their public consumption and drug use um, and community was really, for the most part, in that area, not in other parts of the city. But then due to a lot of community and political pressure, that encampment was cleared out in 2017. And so they evacuated about or evicted about 200 people from that area. And so they dispersed over the city, but when we did our last count of unsheltered uh, residents in 2021, about 35% of those unsheltered were still in Kensington alone. Um, you might have heard about Kensington in the media. Unfortunately, there's been a lot of uh, scrutiny, both in like national and independent news outlets. 
in October of 2018, the New York Times published an article dubbing Kensington kind of the Walmart of heroin, um, which I think is somewhat misleading due to the disappearing heroin supply, but also was really criticized for trauma tourism and um, exploiting some of the people there. And that's something that we see a lot of our community members and those who are unsheltered are consistently exploited and filmed without their consent um, for different YouTube channels, for example. Um, during the last election, there was a lot of extra public scrutiny. Dr. Oz, who was running for governor, I believe, um, came down and had like ads filmed in Kensington as well. And so unfortunately, a lot of negative press not really showing the true like culture of the area. Now, Philadelphia's drug supply is changing a lot. And so historically, Philadelphia and Kensington was known for its very pure heroin. Um, but like most of the country, that's really shifted towards fentanyl analogs. Um, and, you know, the drug economy is really focused right along Kensington Avenue, which I showed you in the prior map. Um, and right now, unfortunately, our fentanyl is heavily contaminated with xylazine. Our uh, street name is called Trink. Um, and xylazine is initially a veterinary medicine. It was a uh, non-opioid sedative, a clonidine analog that was initially used in Puerto Rico in the early 2000s and has kind of made its way up to Philadelphia and is now kind of dispensing across the uh, country. And initially in about 2010, 2% uh, of fatal heroin overdoses contain xylazine and that's now increased. So about 31% in 2019 is now containing xylazine. And at this point we're considering xylazine kind of ubiquitous in our federal supply. Um, and just to go through that a little bit more, so look at our uh, dope supply here. Philadelphia, as you can see, every sample was basically 100% for fentanyl, with xylazine being the primary uh, adulterant. And um, the last check was about 72% of the drugs later had xylazine in it. Um, just a content warning, the next slide has some, unfortunately, some pretty bad news, just to give you a heads up if anyone's a little bit squeamish for that. And so xylazine, unfortunately, causes a lot of issues for us to deal with in the community. Um, it causes challenges for overdose reversal. So naloxone doesn't work on xylazine. Um, that's part of the overdose. It causes a lot of problems with withdrawal management in the hospital. And so when people come in and we're trying to manage their withdrawal with, you know, opioids or methadone, that doesn't touch the xylazine withdrawal. And so we've had to get creative and use ketamine or benzos for that. Um, and it can also cause a lot of problems with induction for people starting on buprenorphine. And then in addition, what I see a lot of are the xylazine wounds. And so the thought is that it causes a local vasoconstriction that then causes necrosis. And so we see horrible subcutaneous uh, wounds, abscesses, osteomyelitis, endocarditis. And the unique thing about the xylazine wounds is that you're actually seeing uh, lesions pop up in areas that people aren't injecting. And so that's actually contributing. We're seeing an increase in delusional parasitosis in our patients at the clinic as well. Um, and so just a quick overview of Prevention Point. So it was initially born out of the ACT UP Philadelphia uh, movement, um, and it was founded and operated by drug user activists. They began syringe service operations in 1991, which at the time was illegal. Um, but then in 1992, the then mayor, Ed Rendell, actually issued an executive order saying it was legal to possess syringes in Philadelphia, um, basically overriding state laws saying that it was uh, banned. And unfortunately, those state laws are still in existence. We're technically outside of the Philadelphia area. You're not allowed to have syringes. Um, and unfortunately, our city council just passed um, a, an act saying that safe consumption sites are now illegal, which we've been trying to start. Um, but we've been going for about 30 years. It's, it's now grown to over 200 staff members uh, at several different locations, including mobile buses. And the, the core mission of Prevention Point is to really just promote health um, and empowerment and safety for communities affected by drug use and poverty with a goal for, you know, social and economic justice for anyone who's disenfranchised. And the thought that, you know, every individual is unique and viable and deserves healthcare and deserves, you know, basic human rights. And so we're able to individualize our services with that goal in mind. Um, so the biggest thing that we started with was our syringe exchange. And so uh, this is a picture of Nicole Sage, our director of, uh, the syringe exchange. And so in 2022 alone, we dispensed 7.9 million um, syringes. 
and we collected 8.2 million uh, used syringes. And so we have some form of syringe exchange uh, Monday through Friday. And Friday's our big exchange. It's a one-to-one -one exchange. So if people come in with 300 syringes, we give them 300 syringes back. Um, and our people who work the SSP are, are pretty impressive. They're able to somehow quantify very quickly what's in someone's container and give them the, uh, that much back. We also have kind of emergency 10 packs. So the 10 packs will also have uh, cookers and tourniquets, cotton swabs, uh, sterile water, or saline for them, um, which is great. And then we also dispensed syringes on the mobile unit. And so last year we uh, dispensed about 897,000. Um, I collected about that much as well. And this is pretty impressive. We've had over 36,000 unique exchangers in that year alone. So that's 36,000 you know, unique people coming into our exchange um, and over 97,000 exchange visits. Um, we also do a lot of prevention work at Prevention Point. And so we do uh, point of care HIV and Hep C testing. And so uh, last year we did about 1,300 HIV tests and 1,200 Hepatitis C tests. Uh, people actually will get incentivized. So if they come in every three months, they'll get you know a five dollar Wawa gift card to help get them to know their status. Um, we have a newer prep program, and so we have over 100 people now on prep, um, including injectable prep. And then our clinic, we have about 57 people who have uh, HIV treatment. Um, we also dispense uh, naloxone. <laughs> Sorry, my baby's in the background. Okay. Uh, we're also dispensing uh, naloxone, and so we have about 26,000 doses that were dispensed of naloxone in the last year. Um, and we also do a lot of overdose reversals on the street, and so we have uh, 86 staff-led overdose reversals in the last street, uh, last year. Um, so I'm the medical director of the Sana Clinic. Um, which is our HIV primary care clinic. We have four medical case managers. We have a full-time phlebotomist. Um, and we have about 60 patients consistently. That number kind of ebbs and flows a little bit depending on um, where patients are. We've successfully uh, integrated long-acting ART into our program. And so we have about 23% of our patients on uh, long-acting ART with shockingly no misdoses, which I'm very proud of, um, which is I think credit to our case managers that if someone's due, we will, you know, go out into the community and try to find them and bring them in, make sure they get them. Um, and it's about 50% of our patients eligible for long acting ART are actually on um, the injectable. We also are able to give them priority at the Reggie Point Shelter. And so if, if someone's unhoused, we're able to kind of expedite them into that program. Um, we will give company medical visits, recognizing that, you know, coming from Kensington, it might be intimidating to go into, you know, Penn's main building or Temple's main building. And so having someone go with them for support, um, we're able to help with utilities and food. So if they're behind on payments to the electric company, we're able to give them grants and work on that. Um, and the goal is really low barrier. So I have bucket hours. So there's no appointment necessary. If they come for, you know, a 9 a.m. appointment, but they don't show up until 2 p.m., I still see them. Um, and so just recognizing that it's sometimes hard to make appointments for our patients. We'll see anyone who walks in. Um, sometimes there's a wait, but we'll still see anyone who walks in. And I offer full prep spectrum primary care. So we do uh, reproductive health. We do pap smears. Um, I do gender affirming care. I've done a lot of wound care. Um, it's a lot of on the job learning for our wound care here. Um, I'm ID trained, so we can do post discharge infection care. So if someone self discharges from the hospital for endocarditis, I can at least look into you know their labs on it. Epic and see what they need to potentially give them an oral antibiotic. It's uh, kind of a harm reduction approach to their infection. Um, and then we do same day uh, buprenorphine injections. We definitely have some challenges to treating and preventing HIV in our community. Um, I think the biggest one, which I think you'll see everyone, is inadequate mental health support. It's such a challenge to get someone in to see a psychiatrist or even a therapist. Um, you know, I'm able to do some, you know, basic depression anxiety management being internal medicine trained, but I, I'm not able to do some of the more complex PTSD and trauma that our patients have. Um, the other big problem is our meds are often stolen or uh, somewhat shockingly sold. Um, patients, unfortunately, there's some pharmacies and local bodegas that will buy HIV medicines for people. Um, and so it's it's a big, big challenge for us to, to try to overcome that. But then also recognizing that basic needs and safety take priority. And so 
you know, I can counsel to take one pill once a day, but if someone's more worried about where they're going to get their next meal or, you know, where are they going to come in from the cold in the winter, that's going to be a more important thing to address. And then incarceration can definitely disrupt a lot of therapy and treatment. Um, and so having good connections with the prison system is really key. We have a couple of solutions we've been doing. So we have daily observed therapy or weekly dispensing. Um, and so we'll hold the meds. And if someone comes in daily, Monday through Friday, we give them a couple of takes home for the weekend. Um, we'll give them a week at a time. We have lanyards that they can use. We have pill boxes trying to come up with any creative way. Um, we have seven-day sample packs if needed. If someone loses their meds, we can give them a seven-day sample until their next refill. Um, we do very fast treatment testing. So anyone who has a point of care test positive for HIV, we'll pull them into care and get labs the same day, and I do a rapid start. Um, we'll do same-day buprenorphine with me. And then again, we're offering the injectable um, PrEP and ART for us as well. And we use incentives, which I know sometimes can be controversial, um, but we've realize, you know, if someone really needs labs, we're offering them a $5 dollar well gift card, we're able to get labs on them that way. Um, or, you know, if they're suppressed, giving them an extra incentive to help take their meds instead of maybe selling it. Um, so alongside my program, there's the STEP program, which is our buprenorphine program, um, and that stands for stabilization, treatment, engagement. And we have case management. It's very high touch, often weekly. Um, we have medication management. We help connect them to legal advocacy. We do a doctor review if someone's been missing, housing assessments. Um, we have certified recovery specialists, peer specialists, um, navigators, we have a social worker and a director of behavioral for health all in this program. And the, the goal was really to do low barrier buprenorphine um, and not mandate abstinence. So recognizing that any form of deep working that you're taking, if that even reduces how much you're using, that's still, you know, harm reduction. And lack of insurance is not a barrier to induction. We're able to get them um, generic meds and we're able to get their insurance kicked in. And the community, again, is also a walk-in basis five days a week. And so, you know, ideally we have appointment times for people, but if they show up late, they're still going to be seen. Um, and we receive referrals from all over the city, um, and that includes prisons, hospitals, or other prevention point programming. And we don't discharge people. And so aside from violence or, you know, threats to staff, the clinic doesn't voluntarily discharge someone. The The biggest thing we're looking for is hearing. So are you actually taking the buprenorphine? Um, and so we do do intermittent drugs, urine drug screens, but it's try to be used as a tool for trust building rather than a punitive approach. So we don't care what else is in it. Um, you know, if we see fentanyl, we see cocaine, meth, that's fine. We just want to make sure that you're actually taking the buprenorphine. Um, and so that's the main reason we do it, just thinking, you know, if we're able to help reduce the risk of infection, if they're injecting less, if they're not using as much, lower the risk of overdose, um, whatever we can do to get them where they want to be. Um, so some of the ways we do this. So unfortunately, the kind of the traditional approach to starting buprenorphine doesn't really work with us um, with our current drug supply. And so we've been using micro injections quite a lot. Um, we'll give them comfort meds, the clonidine, um, anti-nausea meds, trazodone, gabapentin if needed. And then the micro-induction we do, it's very, very small amount in the beginning. And so the thought is that it'll avoid precipitate a withdrawal. And so we'll give them literally 0.5 milligrams, so a fourth of a two milligram strip on day one, and then slowly titrate that up. And the patients are still able to use and kind of down titrate on their use in order to get them on it. And we've had much more success with this compared to the traditional way where you have to wait for them to be in some form of withdrawal. Um, patients are able to kind of start this, you know, pretty immediately. We actually have sample packs in our clinic where if someone's, you know, game, we can give them a quarter strip in front of us and have them take it right then and there and then have them pick up the rest of the packet at the pharmacy. On the exact other side of that is uh, macro inductions, which, we have offered for people predominantly post um, naloxone or post like, overdose reversal. And this was modeled after some work done at Cooper Hospital across the river from us in Camden. And the thought is if someone, you know, had an overdose and naloxone was administered and they're already in withdrawal, if we basically slam their opioid receptors with a high amount of buprenorphine, that'll kind of get them induced quickly and get them through that withdrawal period. And so this isn't for everyone, obviously, but in certain situations, if there's any staff-led reversals or someone comes into us and said they were just reversed, 
um, we can immediately offer them treatment and get them um, the buprenorphine then and try to get them started on it. And we've had a couple of successes with this, including people who switch over to injectable buprenorphine. Um, just another talk on the medication aversion. It's we know there's like an inherent street value for buprenorphine uh, where we are, and so I think the biggest problem is diversion and just selling the films, and so. Often people want name brand films, so the name brand film can yield anywhere from eight to ten dollars per film if sold individually. Um, while one bag of dope is about five to ten dollars, and sometimes less. And so it's it's definitely a, a competing uh, problem that we're dealing with, which is why sometimes we have to move to you know observe therapy for some people if we're worried about them diverting. And so our program kind of came up: what if we could come up with a way to match what they're paying for or what they're selling the buprenorphine for and could we potentially like incentivize them to get the injection of buprenorphine and so we did um and so we have uh injectable buprenorphine program in our clinic since the program started over probably about over two years ago we've had 312 patients transition to long acting buprenorphine and just in the last year we've had like 1100 percent increase from that first year and we do it a little bit differently. So traditionally, it starts with one on 300 milligram loading dose and you drop them down to a lower dose of about 100 milligrams. Knowing that our drug supply is based on fentanyl and very potent, we keep them at that 300 milligrams dose throughout. Um, and we've seen some success. I have several patients in my clinic who've now been on it for over a year and it's like really exciting for them. Um, we also do a shortened oral lead-in. And so, you know, we do three to five days if we can get them up to using the micro induction until like four or eight milligrams, that's good and we'll give them the dose. Um, sometimes we'll give them an eight milligram film of buprenorphine in front of us, wait for half an hour, make sure they're fine, and then we'll give them the injection. Um, and then sometimes we'll do a as needed dose during the fourth week or as needed buprenorphine because some patients still have a little bit of a, a tail at the end that's something we have to address. Um, and finally, just some other challenges, just knowing that, you know, those living on shelter presents a lot of problems in terms of induction. There's not adequate bathroom access. There's not a safe place to rest. There's not a place to store stuff. Um, we definitely have a lot of adulterated drug screens. I think someone last week submitted water. Um, and so trying to work around that and work with them to, to kind of get what, what works for them. Um, the criminal justice system definitely impedes some of our successful treatment. Someone gets incarcerated even for 48 hours that can mess up everything. Um, and then also just this internalized stigma that we're seeing where the patient, you know, they don't want to be on this forever. They don't want to substitute one thing for the other. And so trying to help them understand that this is a medicine, just like if someone has diabetes, you have to give them insulin. This is the same thing. Um, and then just the lack of trust in the, you know, larger Philadelphia medical system has been a challenge for us. Luckily, Prevention Point's been around for a while. And so there's a, you know, a good trust with us, but they'll come see me at prevention point, but they won't come see me at Penn. And so knowing that we're trying to just do as much as we can locally in Kensington. Um, so that's kind of a quick overview of our program. I'm happy to answer any questions. Uh, these are my emails. If you ever have any questions, you can also email me as well. Well, thank you, Jess. That was amazing. So, so great to see um, the amazing work you're doing um, and you know how the programs have evolved um, since I left three years ago. But um, I couldn't think of a better person to, to take on the torch there than you. So thank you. Um, there are a few questions in the chat. Um, one mostly, you know, how how is um, the Santa Clinic um, funded? Uh, so I guess that and then separately, how is the STEP program or the buprenorphine program funded? Um. So we, once once Dr. Bamford left, uh, we were approached by ACA, which is our local uh, Ryan White uh, kind of funding in the city. And so we have Ryan White funding um, for our entire clinic, which is great. And then for the buprenorphine clinic, it's also, we have a lot of either grants or city health department funding. Um, it's always very political what the city supports for us, but we do get most of our funding from the city. Thank you. And then, um, I don't know, Nettie, did you want to um, unmute and ask your question? Uh, sure. Thanks. That was a great talk. I'm from West Philadelphia, so I always love to see um, the great work happening in our city represented. Um, I was just wondering, uh, you, I would caught my eye on your slides, how many unique individuals you serve for syringe services, which is 
really eye opening to the the depth of the of the issue with um, substance use. But then I only saw 1300 HIV tests and we had a talk not I don't remember how long ago, but there were they mentioned sort of folks who were just feeling like hopeless for HIV testing. Like, I know I'm at risk. I don't have a lot of power to do anything about it because I have substance use disorder and I use IV and I know it's coming for me. So I'm not testing anymore. So I was curious if you thought that was at play or if it's just that folks tend to get their testing elsewhere. Uh, I think it's a little bit of both. I think there is kind of this sense of like hopelessness, more so with hep hepatitis C. I will say wherever it's like, oh, everyone has it. I'm just going to get it. Um, but it's definitely a struggle to convince people to get HIV tested, even if we have someone who has a partner that they know is living with HIV, they're, they're too scared to come in to get it, um, which is part of why we incentivize the HIV test. I wish we could say that they're getting all the testing elsewhere, but I can't say how many times I've seen someone admitted to the hospital and not have an HIV test when clearly they should have been tested for it. Um, thanks, Jess. And then um, Dr. Rajagopal, or Amu Rajagopal asked, are you participating in access to Prixati or, or longer acting uh, buprenorphine uh, at prevention point soon? Well, yeah, I, we I think did talk about sublocate. It sounded like, in the, right? You talked about at least 300 mm -hmm. patients, or, which I um, obviously, we love that drug in our, our clinic, uh, the HIV clinic but are trying to get access to it in the inpatient setting. But um, I was wondering if you are, you guys are like anticipating um, access to Brixati because I, I suspect it's going to be difficult with access since it's it's so new. But um, I, I mean, very excited about it because it doesn't need to be, you know, refrigerated yeah. and it's easier to give people. So, yeah, we, we actually, I was just talking to our practice manager last week about it because exactly that is, you don't have to refrigerate it. Um, I, I believe we've given it in the arm, so it's not the belly, which obviously the belly is just very painful for people. And so we're hoping to be able to utilize it if we can get access. Um, we wouldn't do the once a week or every two weeks option for it, just because mm -hmm. it's just hard to get people to come in that frequently. I think the other thing is that it was also approved for use after one dose, right? So mm -hmm. that's something else that will be awesome. Um Okay. Well, I'll be interested because we, we will hope to get that here as well, but we still haven't even gotten sublocated in the inpatient setting. But <laughs> yeah. It's such a challenge. All right. There's two more questions and then we'll, we'll move on to Dr. Tooks. But Jess, are you guys doing any drug uh, checking um, at mention point where people can um, ha you know check their substances and see what's actually in them? Uh, so we don't have that option prevention point. Um, we do hand out fentanyl test strips, but that's more for people who are using cocaine or meth exclusively. Anyone using our dope, we're, we're assuming it's all fentanyl. Um, so there's no point, but it's for more of the cocaine or meth uh, users. Thanks. And the last question is, um, do you see a lot of false positive HIV tests? We have seen a few. Um, I can think of two individuals that we've seen it with and it's it's obviously obviously very traumatic so they get the rapid point of care that's positive and then we we get the follow-up blood work and we're able to figure out from there um luckily the the individuals by the false positive we were able to switch over to prep and they've been maintained on prep so far all right good thank you so much and um there may be some time hopefully you'll stay on um for dr toots's talk and then you'll be some more time at the end if there are additional questions for both of you. All right, so um, now I have the pleasure of um, introducing Dr. Hansel Tukes. Um, he joined the faculty uh, at the University of Miami in the Division of Infectious Diseases after completing um, his residency in internal medicine at Jackson Memorial Hospital. He's the principal investigator of the University of Miami, Miami Idea Lab. Um, whose mission is to implement, disseminate, educate, and advocate for the health of people who use drugs. The IDEA Lab also houses the IDEA Exchange, uh, which is Miami's syringe service program, the first of its kind in Florida. Uh, you know, Dr. Tuke spent five years lobbying the Florida legislature for the creation of the program as an evidence-based intervention to help uh, decrease Miami-Dade County's soaring HIV rate. In 2016, Dr. Tuke succeeded in the uh, Infectious Diseases Elimination Act pilot was signed into law. Uh, today, he serves as medical director of the ID Exchange and successfully passed 
um, Infectious Disease Elimination Act of 2019, authorizing statewide expansion of syringe service programs. As a physician at Jackson Memorial, one of the largest public hospitals in the nation, uh, Dr. Tukes works closely with patients with HIV. He is an advocate for health equity and has extensive experience working with patients um, of low socioeconomic status and individuals who use drugs. Dr. Tukes' research interests include behavioral interventions and innovative approaches to HIV prevention. He is a 2021 recipient of a $2.5 million uh, NIDA Avenir Award, which will test his innovative teleharm reduction model, uh, which we'll hear about today, uh, in a randomized control trial, and more recently, two NIDA R01s. He has received numerous honors, including uh, from the Miami Chamber of Commerce, um, a healthcare hero, Starbucks upstander, and save champion of equality. In 2023, he was appointed to the board of the HIV Medical Association uh, and the Presidential Advisory Council uh, on HIV and AIDS. All right. Thank you, Dr. Toots. I'm going to hand it over to you. Thank you so much. It's always amazing hearing those bios because I'm like, who are you talking about? But uh, thank you. That was very, very kind. Dr. Meisner, that was incredible. I'm coming to visit, and we are also going to start sending our staff to visit you because you are doing truly amazing work. Um, I actually just got back from West Virginia. We had our first Presidential Advisory Council on HIV AIDS. Uh, my first meeting uh, there it was the 78th meeting, and you know they are in the midst of a, a rampant, uh, just unending HIV outbreak and not using the things that we know work in order to try to mitigate that. So um, would love to talk to you about that offline, but they need our help. I'm going to talk to you today about teleharm reduction in pursuit of a one-stop shop. And I do have disclosures. I have grant funding from Gilead Sciences as well as Beeb Healthcare. Those uh, grants basically support the operation of the uh, exchange. First, I will speak to you about bringing harm reduction to the US South. And this slide absolutely exhausts me every time I look at it. It's overwhelming uh, to me. This academic medicine paper uh, was published with my dean, who's uh, Henri Ford, as well as Tyler Bartholomew, who gave grand rounds out at UCSD. Uh, this was how I spearheaded the 10-year journey to bring syringe services programs to Florida, and it was not a simple task. You all are aware of the political climate here in Florida, which is extraordinarily complex. Um, complex is a nice word. Uh, we authored uh, two key translational studies that showed significant need for syringe services programs, primarily in Miami-Dade County, which is the county with the number one, with the highest incidence of HIV infection in the country. Uh, the first was our syringe disposal uh, paper, which showed that Miami had eight times the amount of syringe litter as uh, San Francisco, a city that's had longstanding programs, handing out millions of syringes per year. Uh, we went to the legislature, me and a bunch of students, and the legislature did not really care about the life-saving aspects of harm reduction, but they did care about the cost of uh, infections related to injection drug use. So we came back to Miami, we went to our county safety net hospital, we were able to determine that it was $11.4 million in one year to treat preventable endocarditis, skin and soft tissue infections. And when we went back to the legislature with Senate Bill 242, we were successful in passing the pilot legislation uh, signed by now Senator Rick Scott. Um, but because the legislature only implemented a five-year pilot, it was imperative for us to do rapid evidence-based implementation research, including statewide analyses, so that we could advocate for expansion of these programs. Uh, this reduction in the number of opioid overdose deaths was our earliest success, and I'll talk to you about the outbreak investigation and response later, and that was our second biggest success. But here, of course, that's the introduction of fentanyl to the drug supply. So we were very heartened to see that with the street-level distribution of naloxone, we were able to, to mitigate that. It has been a lot in Florida. Florida is a lot. Um, it was really amazing when they passed the expansion legislation in 2019. And I have to say, I'm so thankful we got it done in 2019, because can you imagine trying to do this in a post-pandemic world where we are the enemy of the state? Um, but Senator Bradley, a very conservative a former prosecutor, said this quote, and I just want to share it with you. He said on the record, I just want to say, when I started my career in the Senate, I voted against the pilot project, and I was wrong. And the results speak for themselves. It's very good public policy. And it, it was truly remarkable to, to pass this legislation. This was us at you know, 1.30 a.m. 
the the bill passed the Senate by 40 to to no uh, no nay votes. And in the House, we had 111 yay votes, three nay votes. And Governor DeSantis uh, signed the legislation on June 23rd, 2019. But there were several very uh, draconian uh, limitations to the, the policy that we were able to get through. One was no uh, state or local funds could be used to operate the program. Uh, like Prevention Point, we were uh, committed to a one-for-one -one distribution model, which is not evidence-based, and uh, local counties had to opt in to the legislation, so they had to pass an ordinance. But we became legal in uh, 2016. These are our very glamorous shipping containers. We actually hosted one of your students, Will Eager, this summer. It was fantastic. Um, the Infectious Disease Elimination Act authorized specifically the University of Miami to implement a pilot program. This happened during my residency, so I got to implement a program during residency. And basically, this was an exception to the drug paraphernalia statutes. Our mobile unit uh, launched a few uh, months thereafter and allowed us to extend our services into um, throughout Miami-Dade County, which is huge, including the rural agricultural areas. And that includes uh, driving to different locations, backpacking, and we're able to go throughout the city. It was important because we had some initial papers. These were uh, my students. At this point, I'm a faculty member and our students are publishing papers. The students uh, always are excited to do. And basically, we showed that there was the people that we served on the mobile unit uh, had uh, lower socioeconomic status, uh, much uh, higher risk uh, drug injection behavior, so more receptive syringe sharing, uh, and higher rates of pre-existing hepatitis C. And when we looked at the correlates with HIV infection at our program, the number one predictor of HIV infection was actually Black race, which was shocking. Uh, so we had to make sure that we did a better job engaging uh, the Black community of people who inject drugs who have been so overlooked in the narrative of, of the modern overdose crisis. Um, but in the, the wake of that survey, you can see this is our fixed site in our mobile unit. When we made many actions, such as hiring many people with lived experience who looked like the community we uh, sought to serve, you can see in 2019, when we, when we made those changes, we were able to increase the number of Black people that we served. Uh, significantly. And a lot of that is uh, going to the community itself and truly meeting people physically where they are, in addition to all of the awesome harm reduction stuff that Dr. Meisner talked about and meeting people where they are mentally, uh, such as not kicking them off view for concurrent substance use disorders. We have handed out a lot of naloxone and we've had a lot of uh, reported reversals, about 3,400. What's very interesting is that if you look at Miami-Dade County, which is one of the capitals of substance use in our country, not quite Kensington uh, in terms of opioids, but uh, in terms of uh, stimulants, we, we, <laughs> I think we, we win. Um, you can see that uh, Miami-Dade County is very different than the other places like Palm Beach County and Fort Lauderdale in terms of our uh, overdose rate, we actually have the fourth lowest rate in the state. And that is because we have saturated the streets uh, with naloxone. And of course, that is complicated by the infiltration of xylosine into the, the drug supply here as well. Um, but we are very proud that we've been able to prevent so many, so many deaths. In terms of the research and evaluation, as I get to my academic hat, I really love hanging like with our folks though. I, I was at the program last night, low barrier buprenorphine, it was amazing. I, when I was at uh, Pacha in West Virginia, you know, they put on the dog and pony show and then I talked to the harm reductionist. I was like, take me to our people. And they took me out and I got to meet the people and talk to them and it was uh, phenomenal. Uh, I am a co-principal investigator of the Idea Lab with Tyler Bartholomew. Our mission is to implement, disseminate, evaluate, and advocate uh, for the health of people who use drugs. We always center all of our research on people who use drugs in the design of our in interventions, in the programming of our program. Uh, we have this multidisciplinary team, and we're really developing new models uh, for the care uh, for HIV care as well as prevention. And that's mostly through implementing uh, a telehealth infrastructure at this very trusted venue. Uh, not as long of a history as uh, Prevention Point, but uh, we've really been able to, to quickly uh, gain the trust of the community. And that's been very, very uh, fulfilling. We are trying to turn research into public policy. We're working with uh, our equivalent of a, a drug user union, which is... Uh, the Florida Harm Reduction uh, Collective in Florida, and really uh, making sure that they're involved with all of the, the work that we're doing to, to uh, create innovative approaches uh, for comprehensive HIV care. 
So to tell you a little bit about our research, so we were examining how to best implement uh, bundled HIV and hepatitis C testing. And we found that opt-out testing significantly increased uptake at our program uh, by 42% immediately. You can see the trend line from when we opened the acceptance of HIV and hepatitis C testing. It was increasing as we increased in our trust in the community. You know, we made some mistakes. We probably shouldn't have had the three letters DEA in our name, but you know, we did. Uh, but as we gained the trust of the community, people were accepting testing. But when we changed the policy, uh, the uh, testing uptake increased significantly and continues to increase to this day. Um, this was extraordinarily important because this is how we uncovered, investigated, and responded to our growing HIV cluster amongst our participants in our community. Really, really proud uh, to announce to all of you that this intervention has been added to the compendium of uh, evidence-based and evidence-informed interventions by the CDC. So really proud. And that was Tyler Bartholomew, one of my, my students who, who came to me and said that we needed to, to implement this. I told you about the the what would have been the outbreak. So we implemented opt-out testing here uh, in February of 2018. And you can see each line is somebody uh, who uses our program. And we had uh, seven acute HIV seroconversions shortly after implementing our new uh, testing infrastructure. The red dot is where they tested reactive at the at the SSP. And it was really amazing because we had to create a pathway to HIV care for people who are experiencing homelessness and injecting fentanyl and stimulants out of nothing because there was no pathway to HIV care for our folks in Miami-Dade County. I know that sounds shocking for people uh, from California, but I will tell you definitively and with confidence, there was no pathway. Uh, so we had to forge a strong partnership with the Department of Health, and this was a seismic shift. This might surprise you as well, but the Department of Health opposed the syringe services program legislation in the Capitol. They would get up in committee and say, we do not need this in Florida. We do not wanna be California. But things changed and through our partnership, uh, all of the folks that we identified in the outbreak were virally suppressed. A mean time was 70 days. It was about 20 days uh, to linkage to care and uh, 50 days thereafter uh, for viral suppression, which is the blue dots. But importantly, we asked our folks, how can we best help? And one suggestion was medication storage. I was really excited to hear that you're doing that at Prevention Point. We have our little uh, mailboxes at the program. And they said, can you store our medications and can you deliver them to us? So we've really worked on uh, having a, a robust medication delivery system. Uh, we've always used a community-based participatory research approach in all that we do and in the development of the teleharm reduction intervention, placing people who inject drugs at the center. And so these were the uh, people with acute HIV infections. You can see the larger network in the molecular cluster analysis above. And unfortunately, only 50% of the people in the investigation who were previously diagnosed with HIV uh, were virally suppressed by the end. And that is because the traditional healthcare system has completely failed people who inject drugs. We are far from our 2020 target of 80% viral suppression in this high uh, priority community. I will tell you, the, the health officials in West Virginia were proud to tell me that their viral suppression was 30% amongst people who inject drugs in their outbreak. And I was like, your outbreak's never going to end. Um, and there are all of these barriers to viral suppression in people who inject drugs. Uh, adapting Merrill Singer's endemic theory, you can see all of the psychosocial and structural barriers. One bright spot in the pandemic was the telehealth delivery of services. But you saw there was a 20 days to linkage to care for us in the outbreak and 70 days to viral suppression. So we actually won EHE, ending the HIV epidemic planning grants in 2019. Uh, to look at how we could implement the telehealth infrastructure at IDEA. So we conducted uh, stakeholder focus groups with decision makers to figure out how we could forge a same day pathway to care for people who inject drugs, really uh, set the traditional healthcare system aside and treat them where they feel comfortable in a non-stigmatized setting. Uh, when conducting our in-depth interviews with people who inject drugs, um, we ascertained the acceptability and feasibility of this teleharm reduction approach. And then we rapidly implemented our telehealth uh, protocols when the uh, shutdown lockdown happened during the pandemic. We chose telehealth because it's supported by IDSA, it's grounded in evidence, and we felt that an innovative approach that was rooted in harm reduction was urgently needed. We really need to take healthcare out of the traditional healthcare system and to the people, but we have to overcome the digital divide, so we must innovate. And so what is teleharm reduction? It's telehealth enhanced, on-demand services, 
low barrier access to antiretrovirals, uh, buprenorphine, uh, direct acting antivirals for hepatitis C. We do mobile phlebotomy in the field or when people drop in at the SSP. Uh, there's harm reduction counseling via peers. Their peers are delivering all of the services. Uh, and of course, I talked to you about the medication management. There's telehealth, mental health, and substance use disorder services, not as much as we need, but there are telehealth, mental health services, and everything is delivered via a syringe services program. The healthcare is integrated with the provision of evidence-based naloxone and injection equipment. So we're building upon the three decades of evidence of the efficacy of syringe services programs for primary HIV prevention and overdose prevention and just adding healthcare. We have to meet people where they are on their own terms and respect their autonomy. And they're, I'm really excited about this trial. So just to, to bring it home, the patient is always at the center. The peer harm reduction counselor brings the iPad to the patient wherever they are and connects that patient to the physician or the psychologist. I'm able to prescribe medications uh, which are delivered to the patient with syringes as well as uh, naloxone. And there's ongoing motivational interviewing and really there's just love. We all know harm reduction is love and um, you know we're able to, to deliver healthcare in that sort of uh, context. And we had really auspicious pilot, pilot results uh, from the pandemic. So you can see here that we enrolled 35 people in our pilots and all of them completed their Ryan White enrollment at case management with uh, a Ryan White case manager uh, that same day. And they all completed their, uh, their first visit with a the provider. They all received same day medications. And at six months, uh, we had 78% viral suppression. So that was really exciting because uh, we don't really see uh, viral suppression rates that high uh, reported in people who inject drugs in the literature. So I won an Avenir Award, which was surreal, came back from paternity leave, did, a, did an interview and uh, won this award. So now we're running the T-Sharp trial, uh, which is telehealth solutions for addiction related problems. And we have three sites, Idea Miami, Idea Tampa and The Spot. Uh, we're trying to recruit 80 people per site and there will be two arms. Uh, people either get teleharm reduction, which I call the concierge medicine approach for uh, people who inject drugs, or they get navigated into the, into the tra traditional healthcare system. Our primary hypothesis is that obviously teleharm reduction will be superior to patient navigation in terms of viral suppression across follow-up time points. And secondary hypotheses are also that uh, teleharm reduction will be superior for buprenorphine uh, initiation and retention, as well as cure of hepatitis C. In pursuit of sustainability, we have to do uh, a statewide analysis, but we really felt we were the right people to do this trial at this time because we were helping uh, lead the, the statewide rollout of syringe services programs. So people are randomized and they either get the, the full concierge approach or they go to the traditional healthcare system and we're following these biologic outcomes over uh, the 12 months. We were able to adapt our teleharm reduction intervention for uh, buprenorphine. Uh, at three months, we had 59% uh, retention in care. Uh, not surprising to all of you, if there was concurrent stimulant use, we had uh, much lower success. Uh, the 0.29 adjusted odds of retention if people were concurrently using stimulants. Uh, we, but if you escalate the buprenorphine dose, of course, you all know we're using 24 and uh, 32 milligrams in our folks these days. Uh, we had much higher adjusted odds of uh, retention. And if we use this teleharm reduction, telehealth approach, you know, going to encampments, going to people's homes, wherever people are, we actually had 7.5 times the adjusted odds of retention. So on the tail of that, we were just funded. Uh, Tyler and I won an RO1 in pursuit of a one-stop shop, a hybrid type one effectiveness implementation trial of comprehensive teleharm reduction for people who inject drugs. And so we did these with one of our EHE planning grants, we did these qualitative interviews actually with black people who inject drugs because it, what was very distressing when our program first opened is that it did not reflect the ethnic diversity of Miami. You've all been to Miami, it is a diverse place. Um, and when we spoke to these uh, black individuals, they said, we want everything in a one-stop shop. We want syringes, buprenorphine, prep, everything. Uh, where where we are. So our primary aim of this study is to evaluate the effectiveness of comprehensive teleharm reduction for PrEP initiation, uh, buprenorphine initiation and retention. We will also do cost effectiveness analyses and uh, some simulation modeling. 
And then we want to look at uh, a process evaluation of the implementation, as well as uh, scalability. And coming back from West Virginia, I'm really concerned about adaptation to diverse contexts. I know that this intervention, I mean, I, I, I feel in my heart that this intervention is gonna work in Miami and it would work in San Diego and it would work in Philadelphia. But coming back from Appalachia, and that's how you pronounce it, they taught me, coming back from Appalachia, they need this. They need this. And they're very closed off to receiving help from outsiders. But I know that this intervention would work in their context, in the hollers, in the hills, as they, they call their little communities in the hills. So I'm really going to look to partnering with some people in more rural environments so we can see how we can get teleharm reduction into diverse settings. So same thing. We will screen people and then we will follow them for a year. They will either get the concierge medicine or they will get uh, navigated into the traditional healthcare system, which is absolutely heartbreaking every time the randomization comes back that way. But our folks that use our program understand that we are really trying to change the game and they are happy to participate uh, in our studies. So basically, I tell you all of this to tell you that we are really trying to transform the way that we practice medicine. We want to lay the foundation for an enhanced model of care for people who inject drugs to become virally suppressed. We want to forge a pathway to ending the HIV epidemic in this high priority community and really overcome marginalization and stigma by meeting people where they are. It's a really, uh, I think that it's the right study at the right time because of the expansion of SSPs across the country, not just in Florida. And I think that this efficacy trial will set the groundwork for future studies to examine the implementation of this integrated uh, telehealth delivery system or teleharm reduction for people who inject drugs. We actually just submitted an R01 for an implementation study to look at our opt-out testing strategy. So a cluster randomized trial looking at implementation of opt-out testing and SSPs nationwide. I have to acknowledge my, my right hand, uh, Dr. Tyler Bartholomew, who's uh, truly a gift to the world. Uh, our participants are incredible and Lily's with you now. You all have Lily. Uh, she's, uh, <laughs> Lily knows. I mean, idea is a very special place and the faculty and the participants and the students really give you hope in the future that things will change for our folks. Lisa Metch, who is my mentor, my new partner, the Florida Department of Health, we made up, uh, my institution for allowing me to, to lead the substance use disorder curriculum, which is all harm reduction focused and grounded in kindness and love. And that is because of my dean, Dean Henry Ford. So I'd like to thank him as well. And that's it. Thank you so much, Dr. Duke. That, what an incredible program. Thank you. And um, I love that you make uh, people who use drugs the center of all you're doing and, and really engage them and how they want the care delivered to them and, and truly meet them where they're at. So just incredible work. Um, there are a number of questions for you in the chat. Um, first from um, Dr. Susan Little. So she asks, how do you support um, the telehealth mental health services? There are never enough services, um, as you said. So do you have a structure um, to help support these? Yeah, so we have uh, Eddie Suarez, who's this phenomenal street medicine-based psychologist. I actually met him under a bridge downtown, like not I literally met him under a bridge downtown, and he is uh, really leading the, the mental health services, but we have licensed mental health counselors, but we need more. I mean, people need to talk. Um, people need therapy. There's so much trauma that our folks face, uh, but the peer harm reduction counselors do uh, quite a bit of uh, counseling as well. And uh, that lived experience is second to none. And, and I do have to say that every single idea that I have, my patients gave me. And I've just been, I was their trusted steward, steward in the Capitol to make syringe services legal. And I'm so thankful to them for giving me all of these innovations. Thank you. There's a question um, from Dr. Nettie Aldis um, to, to both of you. Um, so she was wondering about how, um, how your programs uh, handle behavior incidents, uh, which we see more often in our patients um, who use methamphetamine, you know, with, with the, particularly with the psychosis that's, that's related uh, with methamphetamine. She said, I have a theory that the structure of the healthcare clinic triggers more of these incidents, frustration, authority encounters, waiting. So perhaps true low barrier settings have fewer issues. Uh, but but they do cause patients to get discharged um, from clinic, even if we don't want to. 
you know, uh, so yeah. we, we have a security guard at IDEA and we didn't always have a security guard. Um, but in the increasing frequency of disruptions such as that, threats, uh, we did have to get a security guard. And he's 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 very cool and he he works with people really well. He's really able to de-escalate. He's a, a teddy bear. But I think that we saw the biggest uh, increase when we started offering low barrier on-site view. Uh, if people didn't get exactly what they wanted when they wanted it, uh, it became, and we really tried to <laughs> accommodate them. We we had some challenges. Um, we've very rarely uh, discharged. You'd have to like say that you're going that you have a gun and you're going to harm one of us <laughs> in order to get discharged. Um, but it is it's heartbreaking. That's sort of my concern with things like contingency management. I'm nervous to introduce cash to that sort of setting, and I understand that there is desperation and despair, but. It is an unfortunate part of what we do. And uh, I think my opinion has changed a little bit since I became a father in terms of personal safety. Jen, yeah. Do you want to speak, speak uh, how things are at Prevention Point? Um, so actually very similar. We also have security. Um, I think we have like three or four at a time. And we actually have like a lockdown system that we have to put in place, both for threats to the building, but also shootings in the neighborhood, for example, or threats in the neighborhood. Um, we do have some events where we have to de-escalate. Our security guards are great at de-escalation as well as our staff members. Um, typically, if there's a legitimate threat, then depending on what it is, we'll ban someone maybe for like a week. Okay, you can't come into the drop-in or you can't come in for a week. Um, and then it, it can escalate to a month. Um, they're almost never banned from the actual syringe exchange itself, though. So even if they're maybe not allowed to see our buprenorphine programs, they're still able to come and get new work if they need it. Um, which I think is key. Thank you both. Um, there are just there are a whole bunch of kudos in the the chat for both of you. Um, I'm just gonna. I think we have two minutes left, and there are some other questions. But maybe um, we we are starting. And I wonder, Marvin, if you could put up the um, QR code. Um, for the working group, we are putting together um, a low barrier working group um, here in San Diego, um, you know, really to get um, consumers, clinicians, you know, behavioral health providers, um, government officials, like everyone together to talk about everyone's best practices, strategies, like, you know, link people together to find funding opportunities. And so we would love, um, you know, for you, uh, Jess and Hansel to, to join if you would like. Um, I think it'd be really great to, to um, yeah, bridge what, what we're all doing um, and, and, you know, potentially even um, bring some of the things you're doing in Philadelphia and, and Miami to, to San Diego. So um, plug for you both to join, but also anyone else on, on the call. Um, and um, at the last minute, you know, just thank you both so much. These were um, such inspiring talks. Um, and I think um, we now have a lot, lot here in uh, San Diego to think about and, and you know, think about some things that we can implement here to, to support um, people who use drugs. All right. Thanks so much, everyone. Um, happy Friday and, and have a, a wonderful weekend.